Several energy-related issues came to the forefront in 2017, and joining me now in the studio to review the highlights of the past session is the chair of the Senate Energy and Utilities Committee, Senator David Osmek. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Governor Dayton recently announced that Minnesota will join the U.S. Climate Alliance, thereby committing the state to upholding, upholding the Paris Accord and working towards uh, reducing emissions. Where do you stand on this issue? Well, let's step back for a second. The Trump administration decided that uh, the Obama administration did something that they didn't like. They decided to take us out of, and I think for very good reason, the Paris Accords put all of the burden on the United States and none of the burden on developing countries such as India, such as China. And I think there had to be a better deal struck. Do I think that the governor should unilaterally, just with a stroke of the pen, put us back into this, these types of accords? I'm not sure that's the what representative republic uh, democracies are about. I think we should have some, we should have had some level of discussion here at the legislature about it rather than a unilateral decision. Uh, unfortunately, Governor Dayton tends to like to do so, some of those unilateral choices. So uh, I think there's a larger discussion that needs to be had whether Minnesota should be participating or not. I think that's something for the next legislative session that we should talk about. Well, let's move to one of the most visible energy-related issues in 2017, uh, and that was allowing XL Energy to build a natural gas plant in Sherburne County. How does the natural gas plant fit into Minnesota's larger energy picture? That was the Sherco bill that was carried by uh, Senator uh, Andrew Matthews, which is that is his district. Uh, this was so that we could retire two coal-fired plants and replace it with one natural gas plant. W net decreasing our carbon footprint. So for environmentalists, they should have been all on board for this because we're removing two very old, very un inefficient uh, coal-fired facilities and replacing it with a very, very efficient natural gas that has less emissions. So what we have to have in Minnesota, and before session started, I actually had an op-ed in the Star Tribune talking about an all of the above provision. This is part of our portfolio. We have to have natural gas, we have to have some coal, uh, but we have to have those because they can ramp up very quickly and ramp down very quickly when we need the grid to have that, that level of energy. When you come home at 5 o'clock at night and flip on the lights, a lot of people do that. And what happens is it spikes the energy, energy utilization until towards the evening when you go to bed and turn off the lights. So especially during Christmas time when you turn your Christmas lights on. So we need to have that abil ability to flex. Uh, nuclear power and our three, three reactors is part of that, that portfolio, but the thing about nuclear is you either turn it on or you turn it off. There is no in-between. It's either generating at full speed or it's not. So that's not flexible enough for us to deal with our, our capacity. Then you talk about solar and wind, which are intermittent. They're not reliable right now. I think going into the future when there's battery backup for them that's more reliable, I think they become even better. But you have to have that, you have to have a fossil fuel component and natural gas is far more efficient and far more ecologically sound than coal fire. So we should actually be, uh, be uh, happy that we're making this change now in Minnesota. And by the way, Sherco 3 is also going to be powering down. We're probably going to have to deal with that too in the, in the, next, in the next legislative or few upcoming legislative sessions. One of the goals of the 2017 energy bill was to streamline regulations impacting energy providers. From your perspective, how is this beneficial to homeowners and ratepayers? I think the biggest policy change that we made this legislative session was uh, getting out of the biomass mandate. We currently have three biomass facilities. Two of them are going to be ramped down. It's Laurentian and also Benson Power out in Benson, Minnesota. Uh, Benson, if people don't understand what we're burning in some of these places, and we're using some uh, turkey excrement, we're using uh, uh, ch wood chips, we're using logs, that kind of stuff. Uh, it was a biomass mandate that was included back in the late, the last decade under some of the provisions that were put in. We're trying to get out of that because right now biomass's uh, cost is $140 per megawatt hour. To put that in context, every other form of energy is 40 dollars a megawatt hour or less. So what we're going to save by just making this policy change, we're going to save Excel ratepayers almost three quarters of a billion dollars over the next decade. That's real money for people who are at home with kids or you know, people who can't afford energy, the energy costs would keep going up, but more importantly from a business climate, people who are a high intensive users such as uh, large grocery stores, Flint Hills is a prime example. They use a lot of electricity. By us being able to reduce the cost on this fuel component, they're going to be saving a lot of money. And when Flint Hills saves money, that also comes back to you 
on how much you pay for gasoline. So there's ripple effects that businesses are gonna be, uh, going to be benefiting from this, residential payers are gonna be benefiting from it, and also we're gonna be getting rid of at least two of these, um, these biomass facilities, which really are polluters. They are not clean energy. You, people think biomass is clean energy. It's not, it's the worst of them all. So we're gonna be getting out of that and saving money and still providing the energy that people need. Two more things. A bill sponsored by Senator Bill Weber would remove the Public Utilities Commission from resolving disputes between solar energy installers and rural cooperatives for the cost of bringing the alternative energy source online. Opponents argue it will discourage the expansion of solar energy throughout the state. How do you view this? I, no, I don't necessarily think it discourages it. It really allows the munis to be able to man manage and maintain their fleet as they see fit. Keep in mind, co-ops and munis are, so are small public entities of, of themselves. They have boards of directors and they represent the, the people who are ex using the energy in that area. They're sort of little democracies, you might think, of, and of energy. So the idea here is to give them the ability to decide what they want to have on their portfolio. Uh, so I really don't see it as a big issue. Okay, and finally, um, an issue came up near the end of session, a bill that would create standardized regulations for the deployment of small cell technology to help bring 5G wireless coverage quickly to Minnesota, especially in time for the Super Bowl. Uh, some lawmakers argue the state should move carefully. You believe it's a good idea to move forward quickly. Why? Because right now we have cities that are uncertain as far as what, the, what they should be doing and what they should be charging. This standardizes everything. It also says that these units, these small cell units are allowed within right of ways which helps them understand that these are things that, these are pieces of equipment that are the next generation. Uh, small cell technology as we see it now is going to be a much a quantum leap in our, your ability to use your cell phone and download information or upload information. But the problem is, is that they're not just like cell towers. You have to actually put these more densified, as so to speak. You have to have them within line of sight, which means there's a lot of different, there's a very different playing field that they have to be on. We also wanted to put into place some rate structure so that we can, that cities can have some level of certainty to understand what they should be charging, as well as the telecoms can have some ability to have some understanding of what to expect for a charge. Some cities have been asking for up to $6,000 per unit. And keep in mind, when you're putting units every two or three blocks, that is an incredible amount of money. Mm -hmm. The state has an interest in this because when you're making, uh, when you're forcing telecoms to pay a huge amount of money for the access to telephone poles, that's really what it is, the rate payers, which is you and I when we pay our cell phone bill, are the ones who are going to be held accountable for this. So there is a regional and a state interest in us having a more regulated atmosphere, but also providing the cities the ability to permit. That was one important factor that I had as I was working through this. I actually worked on this bill through the end of March. It died, and then suddenly, like a vampire, these things come back every, every year. And so the last week, suddenly it came back through the House, and I, I applaud Representative Marion O'Neill for taking the ball and running with it after it seemed to have dropped off, and then I ran with it back into the Senate again. But it gives the framework into the cities so that the cities can regulate and manage those right-of-way positions. And there's a specific rules in place saying you have to permit, but you have to permit with an eye towards the understanding of what small, small cell technology is. It's just not like cell towers. And by the way, cell towers aren't going away. This, these, these, uh, these boxes, which are sort of about the size of a suitcase that are going to be on poles, are going to be, um, they're going to be augmenting the current cell phone towers. So the cell phone towers aren't necessarily going away. But the most important part is getting this in before the Super Bowl makes it that the investment that these telecoms are going to be putting in for the Super Bowl will be permanent structures. And that will, of course, be more densified towards the metropolitan area just because that's where the Super Bowl is. But they are committing to go and going and expanding as we move out. And one thing about this, too, and it may not be the solution to broadband in Minnesota, the issues that we have in outstate Minnesota, but it could be an augmentation of it mm -hmm. or in a support of it, is that we can't, if we put more of these small cell 5G, it's what's called 5G technology in, we may not necessarily have to wire all, everything all the way up to everybody's door. This may be an option for some cities to get better internet service, faster internet service, but not have to have all of the broadband wiring up to, up to everybody's, everybody's door. Okay. So I think there's an advantage to this, and it's important for us to get this in now, not just because of the Super Bowl, but also because the technology is on its way. Why wouldn't Minnesota want to be first? 
Senator Osmick, I want to thank you for your time and your expertise on this issue, and uh, thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me.